good morning. It's great to be in fellowship with you all. Let's stand together as we begin our worship this morning. streams of abundance flow blessed be your name blessed be your name when i'm found in the desert place though i walk through the wilderness blessed be your name every blessing you pour out Turn back to praise When the darkness closes in, Lord Still I will say Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your glorious name Blessed be your name when the sun is shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name, you give and take away, you give and take away, my heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name Blessed be your glorious name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. All right, thank you for being here. Good seeing you. You can have a seat. We've got some announcements and some updates to share with you guys this morning. What if you're a guest? Thank you for joining us today. Hopefully you got a guest packet on your way in. If not, please grab that on your way out there at a welcome desk. That's got a lot of information about our church, the different ministries and things that we offer. Uh, may answer a lot of your questions. Uh, it also has a guest card in there. So if you could grab one of those, fill that out, drop that in, or Leave it at the desk. We would appreciate that so we can have a record of your visit. Also, an opportunity to follow up if you do have any other questions. Tonight, please be back at 5 p.m. here at the church. We're going to split up and go attack the different ice cream places in town. So we'll have ice cream Sunday, Sunday together. Uh, so we'll split up, enjoy some time of fellowship, and maybe more importantly, some ice cream. So please be back 5 o'clock tonight with an attitude of enjoying the time together. Um, a new life group will be beginning September 5th. So focus a little bit on young families or families with young children. I don't know however we want to describe that. Um, but if you'd fit in there or would like to join or have more questions, uh, we will have our first meeting on Tuesday, September 5th. So I'll give location all that as we get closer. But just mark that date on your calendar. 
again, please find me if you've got any other questions. A uh, quick update on a couple of our missionaries. The Fraustos, one of our new missionaries, are going to South Africa. They have almost everything in place. They've packed up all their belongings. They've moved out of their house and are now homeless, waiting for their visas. So if you would please pray for them. They're still trying to get a little bit of their legal paperwork and all that stuff returned. Uh, and it's just a big question, a waiting phase. This is the only thing really keeping them stateside, the last piece of the puzzle. So a little bit of stress if you followed them on Facebook. They've been good about sharing updates there, but pray for the Fraustos and their visas as they're excited to get to South Africa and the ministry there. But our missionary for this month is Rich and Sherry Moeller. They were with us about seven years ago when they were home on deputation last. Uh, a lot of you weren't here then. So been supporting them as a church for longer than 25 years. Talking with Kerry this week, he's like, we were already supporting them before we even came on staff. So a longtime partner of our church. They are now in Scotland, have been there for a little while. Um, but some of the updates from them, their son is getting married. Now, okay, that's an exciting deal, but especially for a 43-year-old who's been living with his parents. So they are excited for Rich Jr. Um, he'll be getting married in Montana later this summer. But pray for them as they get to that. If they pray for something for 43 years, they want to be there to make sure it happens. Uh, so they will be traveling back stateside, but Sherry has some health concerns. She had a, a brain injury. So this is kind of a test trip to see how they can do deputation or uh, their furlough next summer. So pray for them with the thousands of miles they will be driving, the many hours traveling for this coming summer and this exciting thing, but also a lot of questions. This is the first time they've really traveled since her injury. And with all that's going on in their church, which I'm sure he'll share updates about in upcoming letters, be praying for them with all of this stuff. Hopefully next summer they will be back stateside to give updates and we'll get to see them again in person um, but pray for the molars this month um, and then next Sunday right after the service anybody that is involved in our nursery ministry or would like to get plugged in there Christine McMinn has asked to have a meeting with you right after the service next Sunday Christine wave your hand all right if you don't know who she is right down here um, so she'll have a meeting right after the service next Sunday with any nursery workers, just to share some more information. So if you have questions about that or can't make it, find her today, and she can, she can get that to you. But again, thank you for your worship already this morning. Let's continue that worship in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done. You do give. You do take away. But your name is blessed in all these things. Grow our hearts together today with one another and with yours that we may know you more closely, we may love you more deeply, we may worship you more truthfully. Help us to do all these things to your honor, to your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stand together as we continue in our worship this morning. Let's 
teach you a new song this morning. We sing a song, an old song that we used to do called Ancient of Days. This is a different song called Ancient of Days. We were talking in Sunday school this morning just about the excellency and the power and the majesty of the name of God. And, and one of the names of God means the God who sees. Um, and you know, I like to think in terms of the God who sees the future, certainly. He sees all of the past but he very much sees our present. And so whatever you may have going on, whatever trial you may have going on, there's nothing above him, there's nothing before him that he doesn't see. So let us take some rest in that and let's sing together this new song. Though the nations rage, kingdoms rise and fall, there is still For my God is 
light of day. Lord, that should give us great peace, knowing that you hold not only our future, but the future of the world in your hands. Lord, that you have um, shown yourself faithful um, in the history of mankind. Lord, we uh, pray that as we go to your word, we would, we would take that perspective with us. Lord, that we're learning about a God who cares about us, has ordered our steps, and Lord, uh, that gives us the assurance uh, that you know the plans that you have for our life, that you've created us for a purpose, and you want to see that lived out in us. Lord, help us to be willing to change and change according to your word to make sure that that happens. We love you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Great worship this morning. Greet those around you. All right. Well, good morning again. So glad you're here this morning. If you are new to us and you have small ones up through, I think, third grade, they're being dismissed to the back right now. Their teachers are back there. So just want to make sure that you know we have that or they're welcome to stay in here. We're happy either way. Um, again, glad you're here this morning. I love that new song. Uh, it's, it's so amazing how God works. We just talked in Sunday school this morning in the one class about the names of God and all that those names represent, and what a beautiful song this morning. So thank you for that uh, praise team. And uh, We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, if you want to go ahead and turn there. I would encourage you, if you... Uh, 
If you weren't here for the first hour, I really encourage you as families to come during our equipping hour. Uh, today we have Promotion Sunday and kids were moving up to their next level if that was the case for, for them. And I would encourage you as parents, you know, your kids can't drive themselves here. Uh, well, your, your teens might, but, but your young ones, hopefully they're not driving your car yet. Uh, so if you would make that commitment, I will tell you that will pay off in the long run run, not only for you, because you need to be under the teaching of God's Word, but when your kids see the importance that you place on being under the teaching of God's Word, it does something. And so I would encourage you to be a part of that if you haven't been. So we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, kind of coming through this thing of uh, the Apostle Paul writing a very personal letter to a church that had a lot of issues. And I want to start today by just talking about something I think would apply to every single one of us. I want you to raise your hand if you have ever had a relationship that went bad. I thought so. Uh, we have all been a part of relationship, whether that was a, uh, you know, a, a romantic one or a friendship or a family relationship, just somewhere along the way that thing just kind of broke down, and it became painful, and it became difficult, and it became a thing in our life that we dealt with. And guys, listen, if that hasn't happened to you, it will happen to you, and if it has happened to you, it will happen to you again. And the Bible has a lot to say about that. You know, Paul had a very complicated relationship with this church. This is a church that he started. He went there. He shared the gospel. It's been 18 months sharing the gospel. People got saved. He discipled. He helped them grow. And then he went away thinking this church is ready to fly on its own. And then he finds out they're having all kinds of issues. And over the course of years, Paul wrote four different letters to this church. He made one visit that he called a painful visit. And those four letters, we only have two of them recorded in Scripture, First and Second Corinthians. And we know that what he was dealing with here was a church that had all kinds of issues, not the least of which that after he left, the very apostle that brought them the gospel, told them the truth, loved them enough to disciple them, come alongside them, be personally involved in their lives, they had false teachers come in, grab their attention, and said, you need to stop listening to this Paul. You, he can't be trusted. He's an imposter. He's not really from God. And the pain that that caused Paul and the breakdown of the relationship that he had with this group of believers that he had poured so much of his life in. I, I will tell you one of the most painful things about, I, I'll say this as pastoring, but it's true really for any of you because you've experienced it too. As a pastor, when a relationship breaks down, maybe, maybe somebody leaves the church and it wasn't because... They moved, or not, not for something that we would say was, you know, uh, an equitable thing that, that we agreed that it was best, but it was a painful thing. They left, and I'm telling you as a pastor, you take it personally. You know what I'm saying? You're like, the, uh, you, you start to reflect on yourself and go, I wasn't good enough. They didn't think our ministry here was what they needed, and you start questioning. And sometimes that's a good thing to question and say, what, what can we do better? But those of you who have been believers and you've been committed to a church, you've watched that happen. And guys, it doesn't just happen to me as a pastor. It happens to you because these folks were family, weren't they? And then that breakdown of that relationship was very painful. And so what Paul does here in 2 Corinthians chapter 7 is he's writing this very personal letter, and in the midst of here, he gets into some things here about how to reclaim a relationship that's been broken. Let's read it. We're starting in verse 2 of chapter 7. He says, Receive us. We have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that ye are in our hearts to die and live with you. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. 
Without were fightings, within were fears. Nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. And not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. And so it's interesting, in the midst, midst of this, I see a very practical thing here. Um, there's all kinds of things we could talk about. We will a little bit about the historical things going on, but here's what I want you to get. And please understand this, whenever you approach the Word of God, the Word of God is not just for our information. You are not just here this morning, if you're a child of God, to hear a message and say, oh, I got the points to that, I understand that, I know more. What this is designed to do is that we hear the truth of God's Word, and this doesn't become information, it's transformation. And this, in this right here, I think this is where every single one of us live. Because probably those of you who raised your hand, that broken relationship that you are thinking of, it might still be broken. And what do you do with that? Or if you're not in that right now and it happens in the future, what will you do? And I think we see some things here. The first thing we see in verse 2, notice Paul says, receive us. Receive us. The first thing you need to understand is Paul is the one writing the letter. Now the Corinthians know that this relationship is broken, but Paul is the one writing and he's saying, receive us. Let us back into the relationship that we once had. In other words, he's making the first move in your notes. He's the one taking the initiative. So often in a broken relationship, what's it end up being? A standoff. I know it's broken. You know it's broken. But I'm going to wait on you to make the first move. Let me tell you something. From a Christian standpoint... I don't find anywhere in the Bible that that's what we're instructed to do. Nowhere. We are to make the first move. Paul wrote the letter. Paul said some hard things. We'll talk about that. But Paul's desire was to heal this relationship. You know, if you break your arm, <laughs> how many of you have ever had a broken bone? Okay, I mean, not, not just a, a pinky, that doesn't count. Toe doesn't count. But a broken appendage where, I mean, the arm is broke, the leg's broke. What did you do? Just sit at home and wait for it to heal? You went to the doctor. You went to the, to the emergency room. You took the initiative. You said, this needs work. Something needs to happen, and I've got to call somebody, go somewhere, get something done, but I've got to decide to do that. Guys, when a relationship is broken, sometimes we go, well, we'll just give it time. Guys, time does not heal wounds alone. Time doesn't do that. You know what time does if you don't do anything? The anger, the wound, goes below the surface. And what was anger becomes bitterness and resentment. I think that might be in your notes there. Anger, which, you know, a broken relationship. You're, you're angry, you're hurt, whatever that you want to call it. If you don't deal with it, it will become bitterness, and it will become resentment. You must take the initiative to do something about the issue. The Bible says in Romans 12, As much lieth within you, live peaceably with all men. Now, you can't answer for what they do or what they've done, and even if you're going to go to them and try to reconcile or reclaim the relationship, you don't know what they will do, but as much lies within you, the goal as a believer is to live at peace and reconcile that relationship. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 15, we always talk about this in terms of church discipline or restoration. Guys, you know what that starts with? It says if somebody has wronged you, if they've offended you, what are you to do? Go. Go to your brother, go to your sister, tell them alone between you and that person, 
Nowhere does it say, go to other people, talk to them about how, what a low life that person is, get them on your side, and feel better about your position. You go to them, and if they will hear you, listen to this great thing, you've gained your brother. You ever experienced that? How many of you have experienced that? One of the best feelings in the world. Because I'm telling you, if you're a believer and you have a Holy Spirit in you, and you have another believer that's at odds with you, there's something inside of you that you just can't get peace, can you? But now you go to your brother, you go to your sister, you talk, you have an uncomfortable conversation, and they hear you, you're right. And you're reconciled. It is the most beautiful thing. And so, guys, we have to make the first move. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 5. Hold your place. The importance of this, because what sometimes crosses our mind is this. It's crossed my mind. You know what? I got plenty of great relationships. I don't need that one. So if they want to be at odds with me and I'm at odds with them, you know what? I can live with that. Maybe you're, maybe you're not spending restless nights over that relationship. You're just like, I'm good. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 5 might say something else. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20 Jesus, in the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, says, For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. And guys, the scribes and the Pharisees were the ones that on the outside looked the most spiritual. You want to talk about righteous, and he's going, your righteousness better exceed that. And they're like, what are you talking about? Verse 21, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill. I've never done that. I'm good there. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, it exceeds that, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, did you hear that? You're coming and you're worshiping. I mean, you're doing the one thing. That's the most important thing, that God says we are to worship Him. You're coming to bring your gift to the altar. Listen to what He says. And you remember that thy brother hath ought against thee. Now, the crazy thing here is that doesn't even say that you remember you've got ought against them. You just know They've got an issue with you. Well, hey, that's their problem. Let them work that out. Not what he says. Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First, be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Guys, do you understand that when you, as a believer, when you're at odds with someone and you've just left that hanging, it's affecting your ability to do what we're here doing today. It's, it's bigger than you, and it's bigger than the person that you're at odds with. It's about your very worship of God. So you better make the first move. It's not okay to let it go. It's not okay to say, well, you know what? If they decide to talk to me, no. You make the first move. I need to make the first move. That's hard, isn't it? And let me tell you why it's hard. Because sometimes you don't feel like it. Sometimes you're like, I don't know that I want to reconcile this relationship. I understand that. Nowhere in here does this talk about feelings. This has to do with us following what God has told us to do in His Word when a relationship breaks down. As much as lieth within you, live peaceably with all men. Next, go back to 2 Corinthians 7. So first of all, make the first move. And if you're here today and you know that that relationship is broken down and you've not at least tried, I'm not saying 
You can be responsible for them. Maybe, maybe you've tried. Maybe you're now in the praying mode that God will work on their heart. I understand that. But if you've never made the move to try to reconcile, maybe that's the only thing you need to hear today is I need to do that. Next, look at it in verse 2. He says, receive us. Then he says, we have wronged no man. We have corrupted no man. We have defrauded no man. Here's what Paul is expressing here. He's wrong, no man. What he's saying is, I've not injured any of you. And I believe that means he's, he's saying, I've not harmed anyone morally. I've not done anything to break you down morally and hurt you. I've not wronged you. He says, I've corrupted no man. The word means ruined or harmed doctrinally. I've given you good doctrine. So I've not harmed you morally in that I've lived a good example. I've done what is right by you, and I'm teaching you good doctrine. He says, I've defrauded no man. I've not cheated any of you. I've not harmed you financially. And guys, literally, he covers all the different things that really you could possibly do to someone. And he says, as God is my witness, I'm innocent. What you're feeling toward me is not something that I've done. Now, Paul is not stating here that he's sinless. Paul's not saying he's not without fault. We know that because in verse 1 that we talked about last week, look at it. He says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. He's saying we have to cleanse ourselves. In other words, Paul includes him in the group of sinners, like the Corinthians, where we need to cleanse ourselves. Paul is not claiming he's sinless. He's saying, in this issue, I am blameless. Guys, in your notes, stay blameless. Stay blameless. In any situation where there's conflict, there's fault. As a believer, our goal ought to be in the midst of trying to reconcile it and reclaim the relationship. I've got to do, as God helps me, to remain blameless. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 2, he says, we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We're not walking in craftiness, nor we, we haven't handled the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. One of the names we talked about this morning in class was the God who sees, El Royi. God knows. In any conflict, God knows what part of that conflict lies with me. And what He expects is for me to own what part of the conflict I need to own. But the goal is for us to not be the reason the relationship has broken down. Paul said in Acts 24, And herein do I exercise myself. He says, I work at this night and day to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. God, as you are a witness, my conscience in this situation is clear. I'm not aware of anything that I have done where I've wronged this person, injured this person, and I am seeking to do what your word tells me to do in reclaiming the relationship. God, you are a witness, and I want my conscience to be void of offense toward men. That as far as I know, I've not offended. Guys, we have to make sure in reconciling a relationship, this is in your notes, you have to make sure you're not the reason the relationship is broken. And trust me, most of the time, in fact, I would say almost all of the time, if a relationship's broken, what are we thinking? They're the problem, right? The very first thing we need to do before we go to them, though we're going to go to them, right, because we're to make the first move, before we go to them, Make sure you examine yourself, that you're blameless as you go. 
James 5.16, guys, is so powerful. Paul said he was blameless. In other words, he's saying, Corinthians, I didn't cause this. You don't have a reason to be angry with me, is what he's saying. You know what? Sometimes we can't say that, can we? I have to go, and I have to be honest, and I have to say, I know why you're angry with me, and it's because I did this, and I apologize. James 5.16 says, confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. And everybody loves to, to take that in terms of physical healing. I don't think that's what that's talking about at all. He's saying, you're broken. You've got all kinds of issues going on in your life, and you know why? Because you're not willing to admit where you're at fault. And that's why the relationship is broken. And it's not them. It's me. So, guys, we got to stay blameless. And if we're not blameless, you know how you become blameless? You admit fault. You say, I wasn't blameless, and I confess that to you. So first of all, make the first move. Secondly, stay blameless. Third, look at verse 3. I speak not this to condemn you, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die and live with you. Here's the third thing. Be careful. Don't be overly critical or judgmental as you go. Don't be overly critical or judgmental as you go. Notice he says, I speak not this. I'm not saying this to condemn you. I'm not judging you and blaming you for everything. All I'm saying right now is we've got an issue. And I'm not saying it's all at your feet. Here, here's the thing, guys. If you're desiring for the relationship to be reclaimed or reconciled, don't go in with guns blazing. Not the way to have that conversation. We're going to talk in a minute about being honest, but you don't go in making accusation, making blanket statements, saying hard things that you're going to have to take back later. Most relationship issues, most, not all, most are the result of miscommunication and misunderstanding. How many of you would agree with that? I mean, in your own marriage, <laughs> how many things in our marriage when we have conflict are really big deals? I'm not saying there aren't some. I'm saying most of them are really minor things where I misunderstood your intention, I, I misunderstood what you said, I miscommunicated what I meant, and what we need to do is just have a conversation. What I don't need to say is, you did. Mm. Be careful. Don't be overly judgmental, overly critical. You know what I've learned that, that helps me? Don't go in making statements. Ask questions. Ask questions. And, and not questions like, are you an idiot? That's not the question we're talking about. Ask questions to find out why they said what they said, why they did what they did, why they feel how they feel, why they feel alienated. Help me understand. But we all too often go in with guns blazing, condemning, making accusations. Guys, Proverbs 18, 13 says this, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame to him. In other words, it is foolish for us to make statements thinking we know the situation when we've not actually asked questions to find out what the situation is. That's where misunderstandings happen. So think about that biblical principle. I am a fool to make a judgment on something that I don't know the entire situation. It's why sometimes, guys, we have to admit this. God knows everything, and I don't. I don't. So when it comes to my wife, I want to seek to understand. I want to know why 
not I'm coming in with a finger pointing and guns blazing. So don't be overly. James 1.19 is beautiful. It says this, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to, slow to wrath. Listen to that. You know what we tend to be? Quick to speak, slow to hear. If I was a better listener than I am a prolific talker, and I am that, I might just understand more, and I might just be able to fix some of the relationships that I've broken. I love what the rest of we we sometimes forget verse 20 of that. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. You see, I think sometimes by being angry, I'm going to get the person that I'm angry with to do what is right. But when I do that with my anger, do you understand whether it's your spouse or your kid or anyone else, if the only reason they did what was right was my anger, then the only way they're going to do what's right in the future is my anger. When we're raising our kids, I'm not saying there's not a time to be angry, to express righteous anger toward a child, a spouse, a person. But let me just help you with something. What your child will remember is the biblical truth of God's Word that you not only taught them, but more importantly, that you are living out. And when they're wrong, I bring that truth alongside them because what I'm trying to do is not to get their behavior to change. And that's what we focus on. We're trying to get their heart to change. And listen to that put together again. So, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Let me tell you, parents, how much do you just listen to your kid before you make statements to them? How much better off would we be to sit down on their bed and say, hey, explain to me why you did that and listen to their heart versus going in going, I'll tell you what, you're going to be grounded till you're 40. Yeah, that's going to work. They're just going to love Jesus as a result of that. So don't be overly critical or judgmental. Next, look at the end of verse 3. He says, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die and live with you. Guys, I want you to think about who he's talking to right here. These are the very Corinthians that are questioning his apostleship. They're the very Corinthians that you could say they defected to false teachers who are saying false things about Paul, and they're not standing up for him. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Paul is hurt? Have they injured him? Absolutely. But you know what he's doing right here? He's demonstrating unconditional love. He's saying, hey, you've wronged me. You've hurt me. But I've said this before. You are in our hearts to die and live with you. Whether we live or die, regardless of what you do or don't do, you're in our hearts. You're important. I value you. I love you. And my love does not change for you based upon what you do or don't do to me. That's one of the problems we have in relationships today, guys, is that we are so performance-based that if you do this for me, then I will, whether that's in marriages, families, Christian relationship, brothers and sisters in Christ, we need to understand God's standard is for us to love as He loved, and that is unconditional. So my love for you doesn't change upon the conditions of what you are saying or doing to me. That's the only way to love like Christ. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8 says this, Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. Guys, listen, the King James used an archaic word there for love, right? I mean, we know charity means love. Guess why it's charity? We could say sometimes, you know, charity is given to those who we could in our mind go, well, they don't really deserve this. They haven't earned it. We're doing it out of charity. Likewise, when we give charity in the community, 
We're doing it knowing that they can't reciprocate. We're not asking people to come to the food pantry so we can give you food and and show you compassion and love so that you can come and you can do the same. No. We love you. We're showing you charity. And what Paul says is when you love like that, you know what that does? He says when you have fervent charity among yourselves, charity covers a multitude of sins. My unconditional love for you will allow me to overlook a lot of the injustice that you might bring my way. Kind of think Jesus loves like that, doesn't he? Aren't you glad he loves you like that? Proverbs 10, 12, man, this is, this is big. I know people, listen, we all have conflicts, okay? We're all going to have them. But I know some people who are like professional conflictors. I don't know if that's a phrase or a title, but here's what I mean by that. They're in conflict with multiple people all the time. Wherever they go, at work, conflict, conflict, conflict. In the family, conflict, conflict. In their marriage, conflict. Wherever they go, conflict seems to follow them. They've always got a problem with somebody. Proverbs 10, 12 might be their verse. Hatred stirreth up strife. Do you, you know anybody that just kind of lives and it seems like they just stir up strife? There's their problem. But love covereth all sins. In other words, guys, listen. We rub shoulders with in our homes and in churches and in the community with people who are sinners. You know what sinners do? Sin, like us, they blow it. They do stuff that we wish they wouldn't do, just like they wish there was stuff that we didn't do. And when you love, what it allows you to do is kind of like a blanket. Oh, that thing they did, eh, love will cover that. In my marriage... My wife, I, I talk about our marriage a lot, don't I? I kind of like our marriage, you know? It's been good for a long time. So, what would happen in my marriage if every single time Kelly did anything that bothered me, I brought it up? Now, I know you all think she's perfect. She's not. Close. Most days. You know what we do sometimes? We don't love enough to even overlook the insignificant stuff. And everything becomes an issue. And you wonder why you're difficult to live with? Love will cover stuff and go, I don't even need to talk to you about that because, yeah, you did that, but it's not. Why? I'm not bothered by that. Might have been for two seconds. And then I was over it. I'm not harboring it. I'm not still angry with you. I'm not going to let it become bitterness. It's just not an issue. But you show me someone who doesn't know how to love, and every single thing is going to be against them. And they wonder why they're miserable. Demonstrate unconditional love. Next, look at verse 4. Great is my boldness of speech toward you. Guys, he is being open and honest in your notes. I, I'm not saying, there are some things love just covers and I don't even need to talk about it. Here, we've got an issue that Paul needs to talk to the Corinthians about. And what he's done is he's gone to them, he's writing the letter, He's staying blameless in it. 
He's demonstrating unconditional love, and he hasn't been overly critical and judgmental. But here's what he's doing now. He's saying, I am being bold in my speech toward you. In other words, I am being open and honest. You need to hear this. Guys, it's it's not okay if you can't cover it in love to where it's not even in your heart anymore. You do need to have an honest conversation about it. It won't just go away. It won't just heal on its own. Love, while it covers sins, it also speaks the truth. I I put it this way, confront without condemning. I will confront you. I'm not going to condemn you. Proverbs 27.5 is so beautiful. It says, open rebuke is better than secret love. A lot of people think, well, because I love, I could never say anything. But you're harboring this, and you think you're doing that person a favor. No, when it can't be covered with love, and when it's still in your heart, and you know that what they've done is ultimately going to hurt their testimony, hurt their life, then open rebuke is better than not saying anything. Be open and honest, do it in a loving way, speak the truth in love, but have the conversation. Verse 6 of Proverbs 27, look at this, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Is it hard for them to hear it? Let me ask you, is it hard for you to hear it? Yeah. And it wounds you, and it's, oh. But guys, what it is, it's like doing surgery. It is a wound, but it's designed to heal you, not hurt you. So likewise, when we go to someone to confront them, and we're going, please understand, we don't go to them, and we're not open and honest with them to hurt them, or to put them into their, or to make us feel better. It's designed to bring healing to them and ultimately to our relationship. So we're open and honest, and open rebuke is better than secret love. Guys, some of us, and I include myself, I've gotten better. I don't like confrontation. Some of you do. Some of you are like, hey, you give me the information, I'd love to have that conversation with them. You are sick people. I don't know, just, you know, I'm not that way. I'm like, I I just like everybody to love me, you know. Sometimes, in fact, always, it's more important that I'm willing to say something that somebody doesn't want to hear if it's ultimately for their good, even if they don't like me for it afterwards. We do that in parenting, don't we? If you don't do that in parenting, you're not parenting. It's hard, but you got to have those conversations. Just do it in a loving way, in a non-condemning way, but be open, honest, and upfront. Okay, Go, going on through verse 4. The last thing that we get here is he says, Great is my glorying of you. I find that very interesting. Think about this. Paul is confronting the Corinthians about the fact that they are questioning his apostleship and his honesty and his integrity, and he's writing them to reclaim the relationship. And in the midst of this, he says, great is my glorying of you. And I'm reading this, and I'm scratching my head going, what? I'm filled with comfort. I am exceeding joyful in all our tribulation. And then he's going to talk about the tribulation. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest. We were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. He's going, like we said a few weeks ago, ministry is hard. And I'm not just talking about what I do. I'm talking about what you do. When you're ministering to people, when you're working with the teens, you're, you're working with the young adults, you're, work, you're leading a small group. It's not easy, is it? It's tough. He says, nevertheless, God that comforteth those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus. If you remember, Paul had sent Titus to Corinth to find out if they were responding to his harsh letter. And part of Paul's problem in Macedonia was 
Titus hadn't come back, so he was worried about Titus. What has happened to him? He's also concerned, what is going on with Corinth? I haven't heard back from Titus. Are they responding? What's the deal here? It's hard stuff. And he says, and when Titus came, man, he comforted us. Not by his coming only. Not just the fact, what, hey, he's okay. But by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you. When he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me so that I rejoice the more. What we find is some of the Corinthians had responded to Titus's rebuke. Check this out in your notes. When you're dealing with a conflict and you're going, do I, should I go to them? Well, what if they won't, what if they won't hear me? What if, what if they hate me for it? What, what if this doesn't turn out? Or, or I'll just let it go. Whatever it is that would prevent you, recall how God has mended relationships in the past. I asked you at the start, how many of you have been in broken relationships? And most of you raised your hand. Let me ask you this one. How many have had a relationship that was broken down and somewhere along the way you had a conversation and that relationship was healed? Raise your hand. Guys, let that remind you that it's worth it. It's worth it. Paul was comforted because many of the Corinthians responded to his rebuke and he was reconciled to them. Let me finish. Would you go to Ephesians chapter 4? Now this is, this is speaking to believers. I understand, guys, sometimes there are relationships outside of believers that become very difficult that might not be able to be reconciled. Notice I said earlier, the, the verse in Romans says, as much as lieth within you. In other words, you're not the reason that the relationship couldn't be reconciled. Sometimes they can't. It's out of our control. The person wouldn't respond. We're going to talk next week. When there's no repentance, you can forgive, but reconciliation might be impossible. But understand, when it comes to believers, the way God designed this thing, Ephesians chapter 4 should never be far from our mind when it comes to our relationships. And by the way, if you're new today, okay, I promise you, there's nothing going on here. <laughs> if you're going, are they really jack? I mean, are there people like warring in this church? Nope. This is just where we're at in the Scripture. But man, it ought to be a reminder. Ephesians chapter 4 Verse 1, Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. And by the way, when he says therefore, he's referring back to chapter 3 where he revealed the revelation of the mystery that now Jew and Gentile were one in the church. They're one. You're no longer, well, you're those guys and you're those guys and you this and that. No, no, no. We're one. As a result of that, the prisoner of the Lord, I'm in prison writing you this beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. You have a job. It's your responsibility. By the way, the only way you can do it with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Guys, we have unity. The only way we don't have unity is when we mess it up. God has made us one. Very much like in a marriage, two become one. In the church, we become one. One family. And he even says here, you know why that is? Because there is one body. <laughs> and there's one spirit. Even as you're called in one hope of your calling, there's one Lord. There's one faith, there's one baptism, there's one God and Father of all who is above all and through all 
and in you all. Do you understand if you have a believer that you are odds with, you serve the same God, you have the same Savior, you have the same Holy Spirit inside of you, you have the same future, you have the same purpose for being on this planet. God says it's not okay to just do this and leave it there. You endeavor to keep the unity. You work like crazy at the unity. We better do it in marriages. We better do it in families. We better do it in this family. Because the enemy wants everything but that. So what will you do? Would you bow your head and close your eyes? I just want to ask this question again. I've never broken this promise, and my promise is this. I'm not coming to you. I'm not going to anybody else about you. I'm not going to mention your name. But if you would be honest and say, Pastor Kerry, there is at least one broken relationship that I really need to, as God will help me, deal with. Would you raise your hand and say, I admit that. Man, just hands all over the place. Guys, we live in a broken world and it's painful. But if God could be reconciled to us and the gulf that exists between His holiness and our sin, for us to not believe that He could reconcile two sinners, wow. Father, help all of us who would admit there's, there's a relationship that needs to be healed or at least as much as lieth within us, that we would reach out and try to, try to allow you to go to work in heart. And God, maybe there's somebody here today that doesn't know you, and they've never been reconciled to you. You made the first move. You sent your son to this planet to die on a cross. You have unconditional love. You didn't condemn and judge us. You put our condemnation on your son on the cross. God, maybe there's somebody here today that after the service needs to talk to somebody and say, I want to know how I can be reconciled to my creator. God, thank you for what you'll do in hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, one of the great things about our salvation is the, the thing that unifies us. You know, there are a lot of things that can separate us and we have disagreements or whatever, but the grace of God, we can always come back to that and the joy that that ought to bring us rather than the grumbling and the complaining. So we want to stand together, close with a song of celebration about the, the grace of God.
rejoice in the grace of God. We rejoice in the grace of God. We rejoice in the grace of God. We rejoice in the grace of God. Amen. I hope that's your prayer this week. Have a great week.